be ready to pray. And it says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, and all wisdom and, and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, unto all pleasing, being fruitful and in the work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joy and joyfulness, giving thanks to the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, and whom we uh, have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that were in heaven, and that were in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Let us pray. You most kind of gracious heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And Father, I just pray today that you just speak through this word, Father. And uh, if there's anyone here that don't know you as Lord and Savior, today will be that day uh, that they come to know you, which they relax too late, Father. Uh, but Father, for the ones here that already know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that something might be said today, Lord, that might make them want to elevate their life for you, Father, and, and live at a higher plane for you, Father. And we thank you for that. I love you, I praise you, and I thank you for some Christ and I pray. Amen. Uh, I told them. The deacon, uh, a couple of deacons this morning back there. The title of what I'm going to preach to you today is not mine. I didn't come up with this title. Uh, I actually uh, seen the title from an old sermon in 1925. The, the guy that preached it, and I told him, I said, if he objects, you know, uh, I'll quit preaching. But uh, the simple fact, I don't think he's going to say anything. But he went on to be with the Lord. But I just used this title because I thought it was pretty catchy. And the title I want to use, uh, talk, uh, talk to you about today is Living Above the State Line. Uh, and what I want to talk to you about is how, as Christians, uh, God has raised us up in Christ to live above sin. Uh, and the simple fact is, you know, as I thought about this, this title, I was reminded back when I was doing children's church, uh, one day it was back there we were teaching a little bit kids about Adam and Eve in the garden, about sin and uh, we had a picture for them to draw. It was of Eve and the serpent. And the serpent was up in the tree, you know, and Eve was there with the serpent. And one little girl said, Hey, what kind of snake do you think that is right there? <laughs> and I told her, I said, Well, you know, I don't know what kind of snake it was. But the simple fact is, it was different than snakes we have back then. It had legs back then. Snakes had legs. It was a serpent that had legs. And I said, I don't really know what kind of snake it was. And she said, well, I'm just going to tell you, it's either a rattlesnake or a cobra. <laughs> and I said, well, why do you set the rattlesnake and a cobra? She said, because if it ain't a rattlesnake, it's got to be a cobra. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's kind of the way I feel about snakes. Uh, I, I, I don't particularly like them. As long as I can see them out there, I'm fine. And don't matter if it's a chicken snake or what. To me, it's either a rattlesnake or a cobra. But I don't want to get nowhere around it. But, you know, even back in the early days of the settlers, when they were coming over here, there was a real problem back then with snakes. Uh, the United States was infested with snakes. But do you know there's actually a line above which snakes can't go? It's an invisible line, but it's a definite line that God made where no snakes can go above this altitude. And see, the early settlers, they knew this. And when they would purchase land, they would always ask before they bought the land, they would, they would say, well, is that snake above the state, uh, that land above the state line, or is it below the state line? Because the simple fact is, they didn't want to raise their family down in the lower parts where they were susceptible to snake bites. Because back then, most of the time, snake bite was was it was promised death. Back in those days, we don't have, they didn't have abilities we have nowadays with the anti-villains and all the things that we have nowadays. So a lot of the people elected to raise their families in higher altitude above that state line, even though it was a harder life in order to form and all that with all the rocks and stuff like that, 
They chose to live above that state line. But you know, I tell you about that state line to tell you about this. I think there's another invisible line, state line, and it's a spiritual state line that God has created and He has drawn. And it's drawn for us Christians. He raises us. When we get saved, He raises us above that state line. Our life is to be elevated above sin. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that tonight. Uh, I was excuse me tonight, this morning. Uh, the simple fact is, I think there's three things that we can learn from this scripture. First, I want you to know, as Christians, we have been elevated above the state line. Secondly, we've been enlightened to the state line. And thirdly, we've been empowered against the state line. You know, the scripture we just read here, verses 12 and 14, I want you to see that we've been elevated above the state line. You know, the, the first thing I want you to know that every person that is born into the world is born under the abundance of sin. They're born under that snake line. The simple fact is the Bible says this about it. The Bible says in Romans 23, 3, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who does that all pertain to? It pertains to every person that was born. Every person that was born a woman outside of the Lord Jesus Christ was born into the bondage of sin. We have a sin nature that we are born with uh, that it causes us to sin because we're born into that bondage. But not only does it say that, does it say that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, it says in verse 1 that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. The simple fact is, you know what we can do about our sins? Absolutely nothing. A dead man can do absolutely nothing on his own. Unless we trust Christ as Lord and Savior, then he can elevate us above that. Verse 2 of Ephesians chapter 2, it says that we walk according to the course of the world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the child of disobedience. That we all had conversation as time passed of the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desire of the flesh, and of our mind that we were by nature the children of wrath. So I think the Bible is pretty clear in what it's saying. It's saying that we're all born under the bondage of sin. We're all sinners. If you was born into this world, you was born in a state, you don't have to do anything to be lost. We're all born in that state because the Spirit of God, when they sinned in Adam and Eve, sinned in the Garden of Eden, God removed His Spirit. And the sin nature was passed on from generation to generation and we live under the bondage of sin when we're born. But you know, so what it's teaching, every single person that is born lives in the beginning under that snake line. The thing is, the thing we, and we prove it by the things we do each and every day, the life we live, uh, we live a life contrary to what God wants. See, when you live below the state line and you live in sin, it's a hopeless life. It's a, it's a life of sorrow, confusion, pain. Look at the world around us. You see all the things that are going on out there in the world today. You know, a lot of people say, man, I never thought it would get this bad out there. And we look at all that's going on. You know why it's like that? It's because those people spiritually are living in sin below the state line. And that's why I think as long as we live in sin, things are going to get worse and worse and worse. And the simple fact is, that's a terrible place to live. It's a place of danger to live below the state line. You know, the, the thing is, but that state has bit every single person that was ever born, that, that serpent, that sin is infected into their veins. And the simple, simple fact is, it will cause each and every one. Sin brings on death. The Bible speaks this. You know, when the Bible talks about death, it's not talking about just death that leads to the cemetery, which we'll all face that if we live long enough and we uh, pass away before Jesus comes back. Even as believers, we're going to face that first death. But the simple fact when the Bible talks about death, it's talking about spiritual death, that second death. And that is total separation from God for all eternity in a place called hell. And see, that's what the Bible talks about when it talks about death. This is what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It says, In the flaming fire taken vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, 
from glory uh, and from his glory and of his power. See, that's the condition of every single person here that is lost. If you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that is the situation, the shape that you find yourself in today. But I tell you, a person that knows Christ as Lord and Savior, uh, we live higher than that. We've been set above that. You know, the Bible teaches us that when we uh, trust Christ as Lord and Savior, as through the hearing of the gospel message, we hear it preached and we come to the Lord in faith. When we get saved, God not only saves us, but He elevates us up out of sin. See, the simple fact is, we're elevated above that snake line spiritually. You know, when you're saved, you're in a place of, of spiritual replenishment, of spiritual abundance. We have security. We have hope. We have all of these things in Christ. It is a place that everyone should desire to be. You know, Paul talks about how the believer gets there in verses 12 and 14. First of all, in verse 12, he says, God is our Father. You know, the, the simple fact is, every sinner that comes to the Lord in salvation is adopted by God. You know, not only does God save us, He adopts us and brings us in to His family. Amen. But not only does He bring us into His family, the Bible said that He, in verse 12, that He makes, He meets to be, uh, makes me to be partakers of the inheritance of the same life. You know what that tells us? As Christians, we inherit part of eternal glory. Amen. You know, God has us. Has, you have a part in eternal glory if you trust in Christ as Lord and Savior. You know, we have loved ones that have gone on to be with Christ already. They've all, they're they already being partakers in that. They're, they're enjoying all that God has for them in eternity. And for us that know Christ as Lord and Savior here, uh, we, we have that hope and that looking forward to, to heaven when we get there. Uh, we have that in Christ. We've been made partakers. So how does He do that? First of all, in verse 14 it says that He delivered us from the power of darkness. You know, the thing is, when we get saved, the simple fact is, Satan has no more, more power on you. Like I told you before, when we were lost, we were in bondage to that sin. Satan had power over us because of our sin nature. But the thing is, we got saved, God removed that. I mean, give us a new nature. He didn't remove that old sin nature, but He gave us a new nature, His nature, that we can live by. And it elevates us in our, in our life. You know, the, the thing is, He gave us power to be able to say no to sin. You know, every single one of us knows the tricks and the devices of the devil. We're privy to them. But the thing is, God gives us that power to see and to know and to be able to say no. He freed us from the power of sin. But not only does He free us from the power of sin, but He also had said in verse 13 that He translates us into the kingdom of His dear Son. You know, translate, trans, uh, translate means to, to be carried away. See, that's what it's talking about. When we get saved, we're carried, we're lifted up out of that sin and we're placed with Christ. We have a new position before God. The Bible says we sit with Christ in heavenly places. Think about that. We don't have to walk around in sin like we used to when we were lost. We've been elevated above that. We have a, a new father. We have a, a, a new king. And we're new citizens of a new life that God has given us to live. And it's a life that's elevated above sin. In verse 14, this is what it said. It said, we have redemption through His blood. You know, the, the word redemption means to be loose after the payment of a ransom price. So what is that saying as Christians? How do we lose? Well, when Jesus came and died on the cross, Amen. He paid Amen. that payment that we owe to God. Amen. See, because we all sin, the Bible says that we fall under sin, we owe God. We're indebted to Him. And the only way that payment can be made is through the Lord Jesus Christ. What He did on the cross of Calvary, He paid our sin then. And He made salvation available to who? All. Just like sin was everybody sin. God didn't leave anybody out. He made salvation possible for every single person. But even though He paid that sin debt, it's like a free gift. You have to accept it. See, you don't just get into heaven 
and spend eternity with Him just because He paid your sin debt. See, He's offered it to us through salvation. But the simple fact is, so many people turn away, they don't receive it. That's just like if I bought you a gift for Christmas, and you never came out of the house to get it, or I never gave it to you, that wouldn't actually be your gift, would it? You never get to take possession of that. See, through faith, we take possession of that. And we repent of our sins and ask Christ to save us. We take possession of that, that payment that He made on the cross of Calvary. But not only did He make that payment, what did He make it for? He made it in verse 14. It says, for the forgiveness of sin. You know, the simple fact is, He's telling us we've been free from the power of sin because of what He done for us on the cross of Calvary. You know, if you look at what I've said so far, that strong evidence that we've been lifted up above that state line as Christians, we should live on a higher plane than that. You know, we sing a song, Higher Ground. I, yeah, I thought about this when I was uh, preparing this sermon. We, we sing a song about, lift, Lord, lift my feet up on higher ground. You know, but the simple fact is, He's already done that. He's done that when we gave our heart and life to Christ. But the thing is, as Christians, a lot of times, we don't say that. You know, according to the Bible, our new life in Christ, above the snake line, is reality. This is what it says in, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1-3. through 3. It says, If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid in Christ. You know, according to that, we've been lifted higher than we can ever imagine when God saves us and lifts us up out of sin. You know, if you've been saved, you've been elevated. You know, you don't have to live the same old life that you used to live. We're not in bondage to sin anymore. You know, the thing is, God lifted us up. That's what's going on if you're saved. But if you're here today and you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, you know, the Bible says that if you die in that state, you'll spend eternity in a place called hell. You'll experience that second death that it talks about, that spiritual death. Why? Because you're a sinner and you rejected His Son, Jesus Christ. But you know, it doesn't have to be like that. Just like we as Christians are saved, God offers that salvation to us all. You know, the simple fact is you can be elevated you can be lifted. Uh, you can live above the state line. You can be delivered from the power of sin in your life. You can have a new life. But the simple fact is, you have to choose it. And that's through the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. Secondly, the point I want to make, we've been enlightened, enlightened about the state line. Verses 10 through 9. You know, the simple fact is, people that have been saved know the difference from where they come from. You know, we understand the new life we have in Christ is, is so much different than the life we had living in sin. We don't have the same desires that we used to. We don't. We become new creatures in Christ, it says. Uh, but the simple fact is, even though we become new creatures in Christ, from time to time, we still get below that state line. You know, it, it's sad that, that we do this. Uh, but the simple fact is we do it because you know why we do it? Because we choose to. You know, uh, I've heard people say before us by accidentally sinning. I just here to tell you folks, nobody had ever accidentally sinned. Because we have to make a choice as Christians to dip below that line, that, that spiritual line that God has elevated us to. We have to make a decision uh, to do that. And when we do that, it just tears at the heart of God. But I tell you, when we do that, we have the ability to get back. You know, the Bible says in, in 1 John 1 9 that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, I just want to tell you today, the sad thing is, there are so many Christians today that are living below the snake line. They're living below what God expects out of us. You know, this is what God says in verse 10 that He wants. Paul says, walk worthy 
of the Lord unto all pleasing. You know, does that mean that as Christians we're going to live in a way that we can pay God back? No, that's not what it's saying. Because you know what? Like we talked about the Bible on each night. We can live a perfect life from here on out for a thousand years. And the simple fact is we can never repay God back for what He's done for us. We can never repay what Jesus done on the cross of Calvary. That's not what He's saying. The word worthy means becoming or in a manner of fitting. See, the simple fact is, what God wants out of us as Christians, He wants us to live in a manner fitting to who we are. See, the simple fact, the Bible tells us that we are saved and we're set with Him in heavenly place and we're made like Christ. And each and every day, we're supposed to grow more and more like Christ. As we study the Word of God, as we receive the knowledge that it talks about here in Scripture of the Word of God, we ought to grow in the graces of God and become more and more and more like Him each and every day of our life. See, what He's saying is we ought to live our life in a way that puts glory on God. When people look at us as Christians, they ought to see Christ in us. It, it ought to make them think about the uh, that we're different uh, because we've been saved. This is what the Bible says. It says uh, that we are fruitful in every good works. That needs to be fertile. The fruitful that it's talking about. So how do we show that we're Christians? First of all, we do it by obedience. We do it by obedience and everything that God asks us to do. You say, well, what does God ask us to do? Well, first of all, He asks us to be saved. Secondly, He asks us to follow the baptism. We do that. That's, baptism is one of the first steps in obedience after you get saved. Thirdly, we come to church each and every day. We assemble together. We study the Word of God. We work on our prayer life. We should have a we should have, a, as Christians, we have a line of direct access to God that we can talk directly to the throne of God. But the thing is, we don't have a prayer life that we should. We need to work on As we grow, we should grow in our prayer life. Uh, in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be growing each and every day of our life. But not only that, we should try to live a holy life. We should try to stay far above that spiritual snake line that we've talked about here. Above sin. See, God doesn't want sin in the life of His people. He doesn't. But the simple fact is, like I told you before, we keep dipping down back into sin and we let it come into our life. You know, so how do we stay above this line? You know, the Bible is very plain. It's nothing that we can do on our own that produces no set of rules that we can live by that produces all this stuff in our life. You know what we have to do? We have to let Christ live through us. This is what it's, I want to read you what it says in John 15, 5. It says, I am the branch, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. See, what he's telling us is, you know, we know Christians by the fruit they bear, but we can't produce that in ourselves. All we can do is abide in Him and let Him live through us and He produces that fruit in our life. That's what He does. You know, the thing is, as Christians, we should strive to live a life that is higher than the life we used to live. You know, we should want to do better. We should want to stay away from sin. I was I reminded of a story I, I, I read. There was a little girl. She was out in the yard and she was looking around and she seen her, her mother's flare bar. And she went over there and she was looking at some of the flares and she told her mama, she said, Mama, you know why those flares grow out of the ground like that? And the mama said, uh, No, why did they grow out of the ground like that? She said, Because they want to get out of the dirt. And the simple fact is, as Christians, that's the way we ought to be. As Christians, we ought to have a desire to get out of the dirt. Amen. We ought to have a desire not to live a life that is influenced by sin. You know, the simple fact is, we should be elevated each and every day of life. But the simple fact is, we're not. You know, sometimes we can be elevated on the highest high, spiritual high on Sunday. And on Monday, we can find ourselves in the deepest valley. 
you know, we can drop below that snake line. But you know what you, what you have to actually do to drop below that snake line? You don't have to move an inch ge geographically. It can all be done in your heart. You can go from the highest spiritual high to the lowest valley of sin all in an instant right in your heart. And we need to understand that. But that's not the way God wants us to live. He wants us to live above that state line. You know, the simple fact is, but the Bible is full of, of men and women of God that, that drop below that state line. We see, we see David. David was a man after God's own heart. But the Bible tells us that David sinned. And it, it wasn't no little sin, which all sin is man. But David, not only he committed adultery, not only that, tried to cover it up by having her husband killed. I mean, that's some serious sin. He was a man after God's own heart, the Bible says. And he still dropped in elevation and slipped down back into sin below that spiritual line. We see it many instances in the Bible. But it doesn't have to be that way. You know why? Because the simple fact is we've all been in, not only enlightened about that state line, but we've been empowered to be able to live above that state line. You know, the Bible says in, in verse 11 here, he said we are strengthened by His power. You know, we can't stay above that state line on our own, but we have the power of God that lives in us. If we're willing to obey and to listen, that we can live above that state line. God will empower you to live at a higher elevation than that of the world. You know, I want to tell you this in closing. There was a, a World War II pilot. He was leaving from the, from the Pacific Islands. And as he climbed in altitude and he, he got up there, he was going a little bit in his plane. And all of a sudden, he kept hearing this, this horrible, scratching, and chewing sound. And he noticed it was coming from the, the fuel slodge in the walls of the plane. So there's no way he could possibly get to it. So he kills his engine a little bit, he listens, and he realizes it's a, it's a huge rat in between the walls of a fuel slodge. And that's where all his, his hoses, his cables for his rudder, and his, his flaps, his wings, it's a place where all his electrical wires run through, and he's thinking, man, the way this rat is eating through this stuff, it ain't but just a little bit of time he's going to chew through something that's going to cause him to crash. Something that's vital to my flying. So he comes up with a plan. He grabs a stick and he pulls back and he aims directly at the sun. And he just keeps flying higher, 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 and higher, and higher. Till he gets to a point where there's very little oxygen and he's flying up so high in elevation. Well, it wasn't just a little bit. No more chewing, no more scratching. So later on when he lands the plane, they find the rat. The rat's dead. Because of the simple fact, it couldn't live at that elevation that it was at. It was a lack of oxygen. And it caused that rat to die. You know the, the simple fact, why not tell you that? I tell you, we all need to be living our life at such an elevation that sin cannot live with us. That we don't have to worry about sin. So how do we do that? Well, I tell you, we do just like that pilot did. We rise in elevation. We point our life directly to the Son. But not the Son that you're talking about. The Son of Christ. The Son of God. Christ. That we keep our eye on Jesus and stay elevated where He has put us at. We don't have to worry about sin in our life. If you don't get anything out of what I said here today, remember this. God, if you're here today and, and you're a Christian, God has elevated you to live over the things of the world. Amen. And we need to live that way. We need to glorify God in each and every thing we do in our Christian life. But if you're here today and you've never been saved, I tell you, there, you can't get above that spiritual, spiritual snake line on your own. 
You can only do that through by trusting Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. And we want to give you that opportunity today as our song leader, piano player comes, as we all stand. Let us pray. Your most kind, grace, heavenly Father, Lord, I'm so thankful for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And Father, I don't know the need here today, Father, but you do. And Lord, I just pray that uh, as Christians, we all live uh, where God placed us in, in His in, in that higher elevation, Lord. I pray that we seek to do every single thing that you ask us to do, Father, and live a life pleasing to you. But Father, I pray today that if anyone here that don't know you as Lord and Savior, today would be that day that they make that choice before it's ever lasted too late. We thank you, we love you, we praise you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. As we say.